Sixth Narrative, Contributed by Sergeant Cuff. Chapter 1 Dorking, Surrey, July 30th, 1849, to Franklin Blake, Esquire. Sir, I beg to apologize for the delay that has occurred in the production of the report with which I engage to furnish you. I have waited to make it a complete report, and I have been met here and there by obstacles which it was only possible to remove by some little expenditure of patience and time. The object which I propose to find has now, I hope, been obtained. You will find in these pages answers to the greater part, if not all, of the questions concerning the late Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite, while it, which occurred to your mind when I last had the honor of seeing you. I propose to tell you in the first place what is known of the manner in which your cousin met his death. Appending to the statement such inferences and conclusions as we are justified, according to my opinion, in drawing from the facts. I shall then endeavor, in the second place, to put you in possession of such discoveries as I have made respecting the proceedings of Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite before, during, and after the time when you and he met as guests at the late Lady Verinder's country house. Chapter 2 As to your cousin's death, then, first, it appears to me to be established beyond any reasonable doubt that he was killed while he was asleep, or immediately on his waking, by being smothered with a pillow from his bed, that the persons guilty of murdering him were the three Indians, and that the object contemplated and achieved by the crime was to obtain possession of the diamond called the Moonstone. The facts from which the conclusion is drawn are derived partly from an examination of the room in the tavern, and partly from the evidence obtained at the coroner's inquest. On forcing the door of the room, the deceased gentleman was discovered dead, with the pillow of the bed over his face. The medical man who examined him, being informed of this circumstance, consider the post-mortem appearances as being perfectly compatible with murder by smothering, that is to say, with murder committed by some person or persons, pressing the pillow over the nose and mouth of the deceased until death resulted from congestion of the lungs. Next, as to the motive for the crime, a small box with a sealed paper torn off from it, the paper containing an inscription was found open and empty on a table in the room, Mr. Luger has himself personally identified the box, the seal, and the inscription. He has declared that the box did actually contain the diamond called the Moonstone, and he has admitted to having given the box, thus sealed up, to Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite, then concealed under disguise, on the afternoon of the 26th of June last. The fair inference from all this is that the stealing of the Moonstone was the motive of the crime. Next, as to the manner in which the crime was committed. On examination of the room, which is only seven feet high, a trap-door in the ceiling, leading out onto the roof of the house, was discovered open. The short ladder, used for obtaining access to the trap-door, and kept under the bed, was found placed at the opening, so as to enable any person or persons in the room to leave it again easily. In the trap-door itself was found a square aperture, cut in the wood, apparently with some exceedingly sharp instrument, just behind the bolt which fastened the door on the inner side. In this way, any person from the outside could have drawn back the bolt and opened the door and have dropped, or been noiselessly lowered by an accomplice into the room. Its head, as already observed, being only seven feet, that some person or persons must have got admission in this way appears evident from the fact of the aperture being there, as to the manner in which he or they obtained access to the roof of this tavern. It is to be remarked that the third house, lower down in the street, was empty and under repair, that a long ladder was left by the workmen, leading from the pavement to the top of the house, and that, on returning to their work on the morning of the 27th, the men found the plank which they had tied to the ladder, to prevent anyone from using it in their absence, removed and lying on the ground. As to the possibility of ascending by this ladder, passing over the roofs of the houses, passing back and descending again unobserved, it is discovered on the night 
of the evidence of the policeman that he only passes through Shore Lane twice in an hour when out on his beat. The testimony of the inhabitants also declares that Shore Lane, after midnight, is one of the quietest and loneliest streets in London. Here again, therefore, it seems fair to infer that, with ordinary caution and presence of mind, any man or men might have ascended by the ladder, might have descended again unobserved. Once on the roof of the tavern, it has been proved by experiment that a man might cut through the trap-door were lying down on it, and that in such a position the parapet in front of the house would conceal him from the view of any one passing in the street. Lastly, as to the person or persons by whom the crime was committed. It is known, one, that the Indians had an interest in possessing themselves of the diamond. Two, it is at least probable that the man looking like an Indian, whom Octavius Guy saw at the window of the cab, speaking to the man dressed like a mechanic, was one of the three Hindu conspirators. Three, it is certain that this same man, dressed like a mechanic, was seen keeping Mr. Godfrey Ablewhite in view all through the evening of the 26th, and was found in the bedroom, before Mr. Ablewhite was shown into it, under circumstances which led to the suspicion that he was examining the room. Four. A morsel of torn gold thread was picked up in the bedroom, which persons expert in such matters declare to be of Indian manufacture and to be a species of gold thread not known in England. 5. On the morning of the 27th, three men, answering to the description of the three Indians, were observed in Lower Thames Street, were traced to the Tower Wharf, and were seen to leave London by the steamer bound for Rotterdam. There is here moral, if not legal, evidence that the murder was committed by the Indians. Whether the man personating a mechanic was or was not an accomplice in the crime, it is impossible to say. That he could have committed the murder alone seems beyond the limits of probability. Acting by himself, he could hardly have smothered Mr. Ablewhite, who was the taller and stronger man of the two without a struggle taking place or a cry being heard. A servant girl, sleeping in the next room, heard nothing. The landlord, sleeping in the room below, heard nothing. The whole evidence points to the inference that more than one man was concerned in this crime, and the circumstances they repeat morally justify the conclusion that the Indians committed it. I will only add that the verdict of the coroner's inquest was willful murder against some person or persons unknown. Mr. Ablewhite's family have offered a reward, and no effort has been left untried to discover the guilty persons. The man dressed like a mechanic has eluded all inquiries. The Indians have been traced. As to the prospect of ultimately capturing these last, I shall have a word to say to you on that head when I reach the end of the present report. In the meanwhile, having now written all that is needful on the subject of Mr. Godfrey Ablewhite's death, I may pass next to the narrative of his proceedings, before, during, and after the time when you and he met at the late Lady Verinder's house. Chapter 3 with regard to the subject now in hand, I may state at the outset that Mr. Godfrey Ablewhite's life had two sides to it. The side turned up to the public view presented the spectacle of a gentleman possessed of considerable reputation as a speaker at charitable meetings and endowed with administrative abilities which he placed at the disposal of various benevolent societies, mostly of the female sort. The side kept hidden for the general notice, exhibited the same gentleman in the totally different character of a man of pleasure with a villa in the suburbs which was not taken in his own name, and with a lady in the villa who was not taken in his own name either. My investigations of the villa have shown me several fine pictures and statues, 
furniture tastefully selected and admirably made, and a conservatory of the rarest flowers, the match of which it would not be easy to find in all London. My investigation of the lady has resulted in the discovery of jewels which are worthy to take rank with the flowers, and of carriages and horses which have, deservedly, produced a sensation in the park among persons well qualified to judge of the build of the one and the breed of the others. All this is so far common enough. The villa and the lady are such familiar objects in London life that I ought to apologize for introducing them to notice. But what is not common and not familiar in my experience is that all these fine things were not only ordered, but paid for. The pictures, the statues, the flowers, the jewels, the carriages, and the horses, inquiry proved to my indescribable astonishment that not a sixpence of debt was owing on any of them. As to the villa, it had been bought out and out and settled on the lady. I might have tried to find the right reading of this riddle and tried in vain, but for Mr. Godfrey of White's death, which caused an inquiry to be made into the state of his affairs. The inquiry elicited these facts, that Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite was entrusted with the care of a sum of twenty thousand pounds as one of two trustees for a young gentleman who was still a minor in the year 1848, that the trust was to lapse, and that the young gentleman was to receive the twenty thousand pounds on the day when he came of age in the month of February 1850 that, pending the arrival of this period, an income of six hundred pounds was to be paid to him by his two trustees, half yearly at Christmas and Midsummer Day, that this income was regularly paid by the active trustee, Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite, that the twenty thousand pounds, from which the income was supposed to be derived, had every farthing of it been sold out of the funds at different periods, ending with the end of the year 1847 that the power of attorney authorizing the bankers to sell out the stock, and the various written orders telling them what amounts to sell out, were formally signed by both the trustees, that the signature to the second trustee, a retired army officer living in the country, was a signature forged in every case by the active trustee, otherwise Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite. In these facts lies the explanation of Mr. Godfrey's honorable conduct, in paying the debts incurred for the lady in the villa, and, as you will presently see, of more besides. We may now advance to the date of Miss Verger's birthday, in the year 1848, the 21st of June. On the day before, Mr. Godfrey Boyd arrived at his father's house, and asked, as I know from Mr. Abelwhite Sr. himself, for a loan of three hundred pounds. Mark the sum and remember at the same time that the half-yearly payment of the young gentleman was due on the twenty-fourth of the month, also that the whole of the young gentleman's fortune had been spent by his trustee by the end of the year forty-seven. Mr. Abelwhite Sr. refused to lend his son a farthing. The next day Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite rode over, with you, to Lady Verinder's house, a few hours afterwards, Mr. Godfrey, as you yourself have told me, made a proposal of marriage to Miss Verinder. Here he saw his way, no doubt, to have accepted, to the end of all his money anxieties, present and future. But as events actually turned out, what happened? Miss Verinder refused him. On the night of the birthday, therefore, Mr. Godfrey of White's pecuniary position was this. He had three hundred pounds to find on the twenty-fourth of the month and twenty thousand pounds to find in February 1850. Failing to raise these sums at these times, he was a ruined man. Under those circumstances, what takes place next? You exasperate Mr. Candy, the doctor, on the sore subject of his profession, and he plays you a practical joke, in return with a dose of laudanum. He trusts the administration of the dose, prepared in a little file, to Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite, who has himself confessed the share he had in the matter, under circumstances which shall presently be related to you. Mr. Godfrey is all the readier to enter into the conspiracy, having himself suffered from your sharp tongue in the course of the evening. He joins Better Edge in persuading you to drink a little brandy and water before you go to bed. He privately drops a dose of laudanum into your cold grog, 
and you drink the mixture. Let us now shift the scene, if you please, to Mr. Luker's house at Lambeth, and allow me to remark by way of preface that Mr. Bruff and I, together, have found a means of forcing the money lender to make a clean breast of it. We have carefully sifted the statement he has addressed to us, and here it is at your service. Chapter 4 Late on the evening of Friday, the 23rd of June, 48, Mr. Luger was surprised by a visit from Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite. He was more than surprised when Mr. Godfrey produced the Moonstone. No such diamond, according to Mr. Luger's experience, was in the possession of any private person in Europe. Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite had two modest proposals to make in relation to this magnificent gem. First, would Mr. Luger be so good as to buy it? Secondly, would Mr. Luger, in default of seeing his way to the purchase, undertake to sell it on commission and to pay a sum down on the anticipated result? Mr. Luger tested the diamond, weighed the diamond, and estimated the value of the diamond before he answered a word. His estimate, allowing for the flaw in the stone, was thirty thousand pounds. Having reached that result, Mr. Luger opened his lips and put a question. How did you come to buy this? Only six words. But what volumes of meaning in them? Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite began a story. Mr. Luker opened his lips again and only said three words this time. That won't do. Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite began another story. Mr. Luker wasted no more words on him. He got up and rang the bell of his servant to show the gentleman out. Upon this compulsion, Mr. Godfrey made an effort and came out with a new and amended version of the affair to the following effect. After privately slipping the laudanum into your brandy and water, he wished you good night and went into his own room. It was the next room to yours, and the two had a door of communication between them. On entering his own room, Mr. Godfrey, as he supposed, closed his door. His money troubles kept him awake. He sat in his dressing gown and slippers for nearly an hour, thinking over his position. Just as he was preparing to get into bed, he heard you talking to yourself in your own room, and going to the door, communicating. Found that he had not shut it, as he supposed. He looked into your room to see what was the matter. He discovered you with the candle in your hand, just leaving your bedchamber. He heard you say to yourself, in a voice quite unlike your own voice, How do I know? The Indians may be hidden in the house. Up to that time he had simply supposed himself, in giving you the laudanum, to be helping to make you the victim of a harmless practical joke. It now occurred to him that the laudanum had taken some effect on you, which had not been foreseen by the doctor any more than by himself. In the fear of an accident happening, he followed you softly to see what you would do. He followed you to Miss Verinder's sitting room, and saw you go in. You left the door open. He looked through the crevice thus produced between the door and the post before he ventured into the room himself. In that position he not only detected you in taking the diamond out of the drawer, he also detected Miss Verinder silently watching you from her bedroom through her open door. His own eyes satisfied him that she saw you take the diamond too. Before you left the sitting room again, you hesitated a little. Mr. Godfrey took advantage of this hesitation to get back again to his bedroom before you came out and discovered him. He had barely got back before you got back, too. You saw him, as he supposes, just as he was passing through the door of communication. At any rate, you called to him in a strange, drowsy voice. He came back to you. You looked at him in a dull, sleepy way. You put the diamond into his hand. You said to him, Take it back, Godfrey, to your father's bank. It's safe there. It's not safe here. You turned away unsteadily, 
and put on your dressing gown. You sat down in the large armchair in your room, you said. I can't take it back to the bank. My head's like lead, and I can't feel my feet under me. Your head sank on the back of the chair. You heaved a heavy sigh, and you fell asleep. Mr. Godfrey, Abelwhite went back with the diamond into his own room. His statement that he came to no conclusion at the time, except that he would wait and see what happened in the morning. When the morning came, your language and conduct showed that you were absolutely ignorant of what you had said and done overnight. At the same time, Miss Verinder's language and conduct showed that she was resolved to say nothing in mercy to you on her side. If Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite chose to keep the diamond, he might do so with perfect impunity. The moonstone stood between him and ruin. He put the moonstone into his pocket. Chapter 5 this was the story told by your cousin under pressure of necessity to Mr. Luger. Mr. Luger believed the story to be, as to all main essentials, true on this ground, that Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite was too great a fool to have invented it. Mr. Bruff and I agree with Mr. Luger in considering this test of truth of the story to be a perfectly reliable one. The next question was the question of what Mr. Luger would do in the matter of the Moonstone, he proposed the following terms as the only terms on which he would consent to mix himself up with what was, even in his line of business, a doubtful and dangerous transaction. Mr. Luker would consent to lend Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite the sum of two thousand pounds, on condition that the Moonstone was to be deposited with him as a pledge. If, at the expiration of one year from that date, Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite paid three thousand pounds to Mr. Luker, he was to receive back the diamond as a pledge redeemed. If he failed to produce the money at the expiration of the year, the pledge, otherwise the moonstone, was to be considered as forfeited to Mr. Luker, who would, in this latter case, generously make Mr. Godfrey a present of certain promissory notes of his, relating to former dealings, which were then in the money-lender's possession. It is needless to say that Mr. Godfrey indignantly refused to listen to these monstrous terms. Mr. Luger thereupon handed him back the diamond and wished him good night. Your cousin went to the door and came back again. How was he to be sure that the conversation of that evening would be kept strictly secret between his friend and himself? Mr. Luger didn't profess to know how. If Mr. Godfrey had accepted his terms, Mr. Godfrey would have made him an accomplice, and might have counted on his silence as on a certainty. As things were, Mr. Luker must be guided by his own interests. If awkward inquiries were made, how could he be expected to compromise himself for the sake of a man who had declined to deal with him? Receiving this reply, Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite did what all animals— human and otherwise do, when they find themselves caught in a trap. He looked about him in a state of helpless despair. The day of the month, recorded on a neat little card in a box on the moneylender's chimney-piece, happened to attract his eye. It was the 23rd of June. On the 24th he had three hundred pounds to pay the young gentleman, for whom he was trustee, and no chance of raising the money except the chance that Mr. Luker had offered him. But for this miserable obstacle he might have taken the diamond to Amsterdam, and have made a marketable commodity of it by having it cut up into separate stones. As matters stood, he had no choice but to accept Mr. Luker's terms. After all, he had a year at his disposal in which to raise the three thousand pounds, and a year is a long time. Mr. Luker drew out the necessary documents on the spot. When they were signed, he gave Mr. Godfrey Abelwhite two checks, one dated June 23rd for £300, another dated a week on for the remaining balance, £1,700. How the Moonstone was trusted to the keeping of Mr. Luker's bankers, and how the Indians treated Mr. Luker and Mr. Godfrey after that had been done, you know already. 
The next event in your cousin's life refers again to Miss Verinder. He proposed marriage to her for the second time, and after having been accepted, he consented at her request to consider the marriage as broken off. One of his reasons for making this concession has been penetrated by Mr. Bruff. Miss Verinder had only a life interest in her mother's property, and there was no raising the twenty thousand pounds on that. But, you will say, he might have saved the three thousand pounds to redeem the pledged diamond if he had married. He might have done so, certainly, supposing neither his wife nor her guardians and trustees objected to his anticipating more than half of the income at his disposal for some unknown purpose in the first year of his marriage. But even if he got over this obstacle, there was another waiting for him in the background. The lady at the villa had heard of his contemplated marriage. A superb woman, Mr. Blake, of the sort that are not to be trifled with, the sort with a light complexion and the Roman nose. She felt the utmost contempt for Mr. Godfrey Ablewhite. It would be silent contempt if he made a handsome provision for her. Otherwise it would be contempt with a tongue to it. Miss Verinder's life interest allowed him no more hope of raising the provision than of raising the twenty thousand pounds. He couldn't marry. He really couldn't marry under all the circumstances. How he tried his luck again with another lady, and how that marriage also broke down on the question of money, you know already. You also know of the legacy of five thousand pounds left to him shortly afterward by one of those many admirers among the soft sex whose good graces this fascinating man had contrived to win. That legacy, as the event has proved, led him to his death. I have ascertained that when he went abroad on getting his five thousand pounds, he went to Amsterdam. There he made all the necessary arrangements for having the diamond cut into separate stones. He came back, in disguise, and redeemed the moonstone on the appointed day. A few days were allowed to elapse as a precaution agreed to by both parties before the jewel was actually taken out of the bank. If he had got safe with it to Amsterdam, there would have been just time between July 49 and February 50, when the young gentleman came of age, to cut the diamond and to make a marketable commodity, polished or unpolished, of the separate stones. Judge from this what motives he had to run the risk which he actually ran. It was neck or nothing with him, if ever it was neck or nothing with a man yet. I have only to remind you before closing this report that there is a chance of laying hands on the Indians and of recovering the moonstone yet. They are now, there is every reason to believe, on their passage to Bombay in an East Indiaman. The ship barring accidents, will touch at no other port on her way out, and the authorities at Bombay, already communicated with by letter overland, will be prepared to board the vessel the moment she enters the harbor. I have the honor to remain, dear sir, your obedient servant, Richard Cuff, late sergeant in the detective force, Scotland Yard, London.